to show
greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise, let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise, let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like God, my God, I need you. Oh, God, my God. 
So today I expect you all to really sing it out because this is our prayer today that even when we're in the darkness and we feel like we don't understand, he's already gone, he's already done it so we can trust him. I'm fighting a battle You've already won No matter what comes my way I will overcome Don't
Whew. Man, that's good to declare. Go ahead and have a seat. Hey, if you are with us uh, this morning in the room or online and you don't know if your story ends in the saving grace of what God delivers through Jesus and eternity, I would love to talk with you today at the end of service. I'll be right over here. Uh, for the rest of you, what a great declaration, what a great way to start our day and a great reminder for us. Hey, and we are trying to be uh, that light in our community, and one of the ways that we can be the light of Jesus in our community is as we connect with our grade school that's just up the street and in the neighborhood. We do that several times a year, and coming up on May 9th uh, we, uh, is the Highland uh, Carnival, and for several years we have gone over and given an evening uh, to allow families to enjoy the carnival together, and so if you would like to do that, uh, we would really encourage you to do so. You can click on the QR code, you can go to the website I grabbed a Friday email that comes from Pastor Tom and uh, sign up uh, directly with them and go over and give an evening so that uh, Highland families uh, can share that night together and we can just be um, the presence of Jesus uh, there for that evening. Um, otherwise, I mean, if you are new to us, there are several cards in front of you. There is a prayer card and a story card. I mean, if you... Uh, have something that you would like to share, we would love to hear it, uh, either in a prayer request or in some way that God is moving in your life and you have a story of that, man, grab that card and would you write that out uh, and drop it in the boxes on the pillars out in the foyer. We would love uh, to have that. Um, there's also offering envelopes there that you can use as well. And then there's a really tall card with the red top. Uh, and if we don't know who you are, uh, I would love to know that. I'd love to reach out and connect with you this week. If you could just uh, fill that out, um, I'll be right over there uh, at the end of the service. Bring that by, uh, or you can grab the QR code. Thanks. Friends, <laughs> oh, I couldn't resist. <clears throat> I figured if we're going to go retro, we're going to go all the way. So, man, <laughs> it is so, so good to be here. Um, and we're going to continue on in uh, the story today. Uh, and we're going to meet up with uh, an individual. Um, we started the story uh, at the beginning of Genesis. And in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, a lot of the story is about humanity, about mankind. And then we get to the end of chapter 11, and we meet a family, and really an individual, uh, and we meet a guy by the name of Abram. And let me introduce you to his family. <clears throat> These are the records of the generations of a guy by the name of Terah. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran became the father of Lot. So we have a grandfather, three sons, and, another, and a son or, or, or a nephew of the guy that we're going to hang out with and get to know just a little bit. Well, that's this family down here in the corner. And they live in a place called the Ur of Chaldees. It's down where the Tigris and the Euphrates River come together. And while they're down there um, in this land, one of the boys dies. He dies. Um, it's Lot's dad. Lot's dad passes away. Well, uh, and then sometime later, um, it's time to move. And so one of the brothers, the left, the other brother stays. Nahor has a wife. He started a family. Ah, we're going to stay here. So Tira, the older guy, comes up here, up the Euphrates River, and, and he makes a town, and he names it after his son that's died, and it's called Haran. Well, 
Abram and Sarai go with him along with the nephew Lot. And they live here for an undisclosed amount of time. We don't know how long. Um, and then, lo and behold, uh, in Haran here, Terah dies. Sorry, Terah. <clears throat> and then, at 75 years of age, um, God speaks these words to Abram. Now go... Now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse and all the families on earth will be blessed. Um, so, um, folks, how would it go, um, ladies, if your husband comes in and into your retirement years and says, hey, we're going we're gonna to pick up and we're going to move. Where are we going? I don't know. How's that conversation go? Yeah. Um, so Abram comes back to the, to, to the house and he says, honey, we're, we're, we're going. I don't know where we're going. We're just going to go. God spoke to me. <laughs> um, so they do. Abram and Sarah, Sarai and, and Lot go up. Uh, make a long journey, and they end up here in the land of Canaan. Uh, and it's pretty funny. They end up in a town um, by the Oak of Mamre. Um, the town's called uh, Shechem. Um, pretty significant landscape if you name the place by the tree that is there. How many other trees do you think are there if it's known by the Oak of Mamre? Um, so they spend 11 years getting here. They end up, they go down, and uh, because of a famine, they end up in Egypt. Um, uh, Abram tells a bit of a fib about his relationship with his wife. Um, they end up with a, a scad of stuff from the Egyptians to say, get out of here. You're a problem. Uh, and so they go back here wealthier than they were before. And 11 years later, this promise that God has given them, they'll be a great nation, they still don't have any children. So Sarai and Abram help God. Um, in Egypt, they picked up a, a, a maid wife for, or a maid servant for Sarai, and Sarai says to Abram, hey, how about we have a child with her? And, and that'll begin this promise that God's made for us. You ever tried to help God? <clears throat> It created a mess. Created a mess. Didn't go well. So um, uh, they, they're wealthy. Uh, things go very well. They have too many, guy, too many people that are with them to take care of all of their animals. And so Lot and Abram separate. Um, and another 13 years goes by. Lots of stuff. And God revisits Abram. Shares the promise again with him. And says, um, does anybody know what 75 and 11 and 13 is? 99. At 99 years old, God says, um, you're, you're going to have a child. Uh, Sarai overhears the conversation and laughs. Um, ladies, how many of you would laugh at 90 years of age being told you're going to have a child? <laughs> hmm. Is that a nervous laugh? A year later, they have a child, and his name is Isaac. Uh, and God changes their names to Abraham and Sarah um, and begins an incredible story of bringing humanity, Jesus, through a family. It's a great story. Let's hear what Christian has to say about it today. Can we give Craig a round of applause for that story, Colin? <laughs> Show of hands, who's enjoying story time? Yeah, it's great. Honestly, the best you'll ever learn the Bible is go serve in kids' ministry. They'll be teaching them the lesson, and you'll be going, oh, that's what that's about? <laughs> uh, there's something amazing about stories. Um, we've been talking about in this series the power of stories. 
Think of the stories that have survived the test of time that we still tell today from a long, long time ago. Stories, they have this ability to help us remember things, to to put things deep in our brain, to impact us, to transform us. Um, And yet, we have the greatest story ever told. And so over these seven weeks, we're looking at parts of these stories. Um, I want to talk about some big stories in recent memory, all right? If if you're a part of uh, this world, which you are, because we're all here, um, we've been impacted by some pretty big stories. We're kind of in a great age of stories, if you think about it. All of our movies tell stories, all our TV shows tell stories, all of our literature uh, tells stories. And in fact, in the last hundred years or so, um, we have some of the, the biggest, most shared stories of all time. And I want to talk with you a little bit today about what I call the big three, all right? The big three, and what I mean by the big three is the big three English authors who have given us three big series of literature and stories that have taken over the world by storm. Can anybody guess the first of the big three, all right? So, oh, it is C.S. Lewis. Yeah, and sorry if I exclude any of your favorites, but this is my big three, right? The first one is this series, The Chronicles of Narnia, all right? Over 120 million copies sold of this series, right? And this series is so impactful. Maybe some of you in this room have read them. Maybe if you haven't read them, you've watched one of the movies. Maybe if you haven't read them or watched one of the movies, you're still aware of them just because of their gravity and how, how big they are. I can still remember being in elementary school, public elementary school, and going to story time in the library and reading The Lion, The Witch, and The Wardrobe, or having it read to our class. I can still remember going to the premiere of the first movie, um, because these stories are so big, they haven't just become books, they've become movies, they've become merchandise, they've become so much bigger than just the story themselves. Our second one, any guesses? <laughs> Tolkien, right? Uh, Tolkien, Lord of the Rings, a little more than C.S. Lewis, right? Over 150 million copies sold. How many of you, just show of hands, have read Lord of the Rings? Wow, that's impressive. I remember uh, picking it up to read it for like fourth grade reading and being like, this book is way too long. (laughs) I'm not going to read this. Uh, But I remember seeing the movies, right? Again, the impact of these stories. They've become movies. And I remember seeing the first movie in theaters and just being blown away by it. Couldn't wait for the next two to come out and then falling asleep during the third because it's too long, but, uh, <laughs> but, but they're great stories, and I'm sure some of you have, have cherished memories with, with these stories. And then for our younger audience, can anybody guess what the third one is? Yes, J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter, over 600 million copies sold. It's been translated into 85 different languages. Do you believe in the power of story? Stories, they transform us. They, they take over us. And, and part, of, part of the question I want to ask is, why, why do these stories, why do they have such a far reach? Right? All three of these authors, all, all three of these stories, they're full of fantastical lands and talking animals and magical creatures and witches and wizards, right? All, all, all of these books All three of these series are full of all this stuff, right? All make-believe. But yet, why do they draw us in? Why do they sell so many copies? And what I want to argue today is that the reason they do that is because they still touch on some things that humans really care about. Believe it or not, they still tell the story of good versus evil. Sometimes we want to act like we're a world that is kind of over good and evil and we don't care about right and wrong. But there's 600 million copies of a book about good, good versus evil that I think will tell you otherwise. We still care about that. We, we see the themes of love and friendship in all of these book series. And, and that's something that still is near and dear to our heart. And we also see the theme of family and uncovering mystery And and figuring out what's there. And all all these things and probably many more lie in the subjects of these books. But I want to focus on this last one, this idea of family. See, uh, in the Harry Potter series, 
Um, one of the things that I think is so, so great about it that brings people in is that the main character, kind of, it's a coming-of-age story. And what he has to do is he has to wrestle with what he knows about his family and then what he learns about his family. See, our family story is the first story that really shapes who we are, for better or for worse. Right? Our family story is the first story that begins to give us ideas of who we are, where we come from, what, what the world's about, what, what is life about. And for some of us, it's a good story. It's a cherished story. It's one that we find pride in, and we see moments where something was passed on to us. For some of us, it's a, it's a complicated story. It's a confusing story where maybe something was missing or something was lacking, and it, it was messy. It made the world messy for us. But, but regardless, it's the first story that we start to interact with. And its roots grow deep in us. And we know they grow deep in us because we find ourselves years later saying and do thing, doing things that our family said and did that we said we would never say or do. It's deep in who we are. See, in this story, uh, the main character, he, he grows up thinking that his parents have died in a car accident. And he lives with his uncle and aunt, and they're very mean to him. He has to sleep in a staircase, or in a closet underneath the staircase. And he's totally neglected. This is, this is his life. This is what he knows of himself. And then, when he turns 13, he finds there's this whole other world, this whole magical world that, that he comes from. And that his parents are actually famous because they actually died fighting the most evil villain that ever existed in that land. He, also, he finds out that he's rich. <laughs> he finds out that he survived an attack from this evil person. And his whole identity formation starts to change. See, I, I know in this book, even the headmaster of the school believes stories are important because he actually didn't want the main character to know any of this until he was of age because he thought the story of being famous and rich might corrupt his character, right? And we know stories, family stories, they don't hit us all the same, right? We have siblings and they, they hit our personalities and some of us live up or, cr or crumble under or reject or accept whatever story was to us. But, but this headmaster was so afraid of the, st of the story of his richness and his fame he said, we need to hide him from that. And what we find in the story is that growing up, always being picked on, gave him a heart to protect others. Gave him a heart to have compassion for others. One of the parts of, uh, of one of the books that I, I really love, that I just want to share briefly, briefly with you, is uh, the main character, Harry, right? He learns that his parents stood up against this, very villain, this big villain, this evil guy. And the evil guy comes back. And in the first scene where the evil guy comes back, he's trying to kill Harry. And Harry's afraid, and he's hiding, and he doesn't know if he has the strength to do what's necessary to fight back. And he has this memory of his parents. And he said, my parents died standing up to evil like this in the world. And so if that's my course too, I'm taking it up after them. This moment of inspiration from his family story. See, we all have these family stories in this room, good, bad, complicated, and they all inform us. They all impact us in ways that we make decisions. I'm sure right now you can think of some, someone, maybe a, a parent, a grandparent um, who, who was there, who made an impact in your life, who, who you do something based on them, or you do something based on the exact opposite of them. I also think one thing I love about this is we connect with kind of the unfolding story of families. One of my favorite things is, uh, you know, unfortunately, sometimes we have to go to family funerals. How many of you have had this experience where, uh, you know, at funerals, people let their guard down and the stories start to come out? And have you ever been at one and you've heard a family story that totally, like, removed another layer of mystery to your family, right? Because we have these family secrets. And then all of a sudden, you're at a funeral and they're like, no, that's not your uncle. 
that's your Uncle John's second wife. He was married before. And you're like, he was married before? And then all of a sudden, all these, all these things that have happened over the last, like, 20 years start to make more sense. And you're like, there's a whole new layer to your family. There's a whole new layer to who you are, right? Maybe growing up, you find out things about your parents. And then you see how they act towards you. And you're like, oh, I, I, the picture makes sense now. See, in order to understand ourselves, we have to understand our family story. We're not trapped by our family story, but we, we live out of our family story. It's the first story we interact with. And so today, as we talk about the second movement in Scripture, in this big story, in this greatest story ever told, we're going to talk about the family of God. Because the second really main point is this idea of what and who is the family of God, right? Throughout the scriptures, we, we see this phrase like God's chosen people, God's family, the family of God, right? We see this repeated over and over and over again. And so today, we're just going to look at a small section of scripture out of the story that Pastor Craig shared. And we're going to ask the question, who is God's family? What are they about? And what are the implications for my life as I look at my own identity, faith, and purpose in light of God's family. And so last week, we really talked about the beginning of the scriptures, which is about the creation and the fall, right? We get this paradox in the first couple uh, chapters of Genesis where humanity is good, but humanity is bad, right? We're the image of God, but we also want to replace God. Because Tom said it's whose story? God's story, right? But we want to become the main character. And really what, what Tom shared with you guys last week, which is that humanity chose its own, uh, its own selfishness to put itself in the main stage. It had consequences, but God provided. That's just the repeated theme for the next 11 chapters, or for the first 11 chapters, right? Because then the whole world is bad and there's consequences, but God chooses Noah to, to protect and to, and to carry on. And then all the people get together and, and they want to make a great tower to heaven because they want to make a name for themselves, right? Humanity wants to stand on its own two feet. That Once again, putting themselves in the center, making themselves the main character, putting them as God, and then they get scattered, right? But in this ebb and flow of Failure and God rescue, and failure and God rescue, failure and God rescue. When that tower is spread, we get a list of families, just like Pastor Craig shared. And as that family line starts to get to the bottom, we meet a character named Abram. Abram is not special. There's nothing about Abram that is like, this is the perfect guy to be God's chosen one. We just know that God chooses him. And right away, here, here, this is just a reinforcement that God is the main character in the story. Right away, before we know any details about Abraham, we just know his name, we just know his family. God creates his family. This is what it says in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Let's read it together. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your father's country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed." This is the establishment of God's family, right? He's let humanity try and figure it out. And they've just kind of been stumbling and continuing to put themselves in the place of God. So God says, let me establish my family. I want to give you some observations just from God's words, from his call to Abram. Because this is what starts the entire movement. This is the origin story of who God's family is. It's these words that God spoke. And so here's a couple observations from those verses we just read. The first one is, the story begins with, the Lord said. The origin story of God's family is not a person that did all this work to be 
holy and righteous enough to carry the family of God. It's not about some very special person that had the power and the accolades. It's just God saying, that's a guy, and the Lord said, because it's his story, it's his family, and it's something he did, it's something he started. The story of God begins with the Lord said. Uh, I also want to share with you guys, this is, this, in a way, this is kind of like God's recreation, his redemption of that original garden mistake. I want to show you just a little bit later in Abraham's story, uh, we get this part where God's kind of commissioning Abraham to be the family of God. And, and this is what it says in Genesis chapter 15. Uh, there's, there's a whole lot. You should go read this chapter. We don't have time to talk about this whole story, but I want to focus on this. As the sun was going down, God's getting ready to make this pact with Abraham, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. Does anybody remember the last time God put someone in a deep sleep? Adam. It's the same exact phrase right here. When God is making a pact with Abram that he is going to be his person, he sets the creation all over again. Right? In one sense, humanity is all of God's family. But in the story, this is when God says, you know what? We need a plan, and I'm going to choose my family. I'm going to create my family through one man. Another observation is God uses this method of using one to reach the many, right? Maybe reading this story, you've had this question of, well, why doesn't God just say to everyone what he said to Abram? Like, wh why doesn't God just, if God could say this to Abram, why doesn't he just say this to everyone? Which is a good and valid question. And one, that's answers are far beyond what I can tell you. But in the story, in the story of Scripture, one thing we know that's true about God is that God often chooses the one to reach the many. Right at Mountain View, we like to say uh, we do relational ministry here. It's a phrase we use, and maybe sometimes it's confusing to you. This is what it means. We use one to reach the many. Because God is a personal God. And it's not about flipping a switch in everybody. It's about relationship. It's about choice. It's about people desiring God with their own hearts. And so God often uses this plan of one to reach the many, and his family is the one he wants to reach the whole world. Another reflection is God still sees humanity as his family, right? Even though he tells Abraham this intimate blessing and curse promise that those who bless you I will bless and those who curse you I will curse even though he gives that personal promise to Abram it's so that he has a so that the reason I'm doing this is so that you will bless all of the earth right sometimes we just look at that promise and we think oh these are the people that are special to God no all people are special to God because God says to Abram, through this family, you will bless the entire earth. He still sees all of humanity as his family, even though he is choosing a specific family. One more observation is God still desires the blessing of garden life to become reality. Right? God wants this family to bring the garden back to the world. The story we read last week about in the beginning and the garden and God walked with man and they were together. This is what God still wants. And he wants to reach it with this family. In fact, throughout the scriptures following this point, you're going to see a family struggle with their identity. You're going to see a family struggle to grasp this part of who they're supposed to be as the family of God. And some of them are going to get this right at some times, and a lot of times they're going to get it really wrong. And then there's going to be prophets who come and say, don't you remember this is who you're supposed to be? You're supposed to be not the, not the chosen, not just the chosen people, the chosen family that brings the garden back to the entire world. In some ways, this is the story of Scripture right here. This struggle to be the family that God called them to be. 
And so if you want to find the origin of the family of God, look no further than these words that God gives Abram in Genesis chapter 12. The question is, why does this matter to us today? Why why does this family origin story about this chosen family, Abram, that eventually became the nation of Israel, why does that matter to us today? The first part is because Jesus comes from this family. Jesus comes from this family story. In fact, I want you to think this. In, In the first century, there were these people that believed in who Jesus was, right? Jesus died. The day Jesus died... He had zero followers. Most of his disciples thought the movement was dead. And yet there were people that believed so much that Jesus raised from the dead that he was God that they felt like they had to spread it to everyone around them. It changed the way they lived their lives. They were taking care of the poor. They were taking care of the sick. They were doing everything to follow and obey the teachings of Jesus because they believed who he was. And then these letters were getting crafted, and they were sending these gospels around, and these gospels were going to places where people believed other things different than Jesus, or they had no idea who Jesus was at all. And with these gospels, they're reading them with the hopes of saying, this is who Jesus is. You should follow him. That sounds like an important important job, yeah? Are you guys with me? Yeah. And so you would want to make that letter so convincing, so exciting, so interesting that right off the hook, they're with you. And then in Matthew chapter 1, right, for us as modern readers, we get an account of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham, and the ellipses are son of of this, person, son of this, person, son of this. How many of you have read Matthew chapter 1 and you're like, Why do I have to read this? But you have to understand, in the first century, if you were writing to somebody, trying to get them to believe who Jesus was, who understands their family story, who who knows the importance, like, he's not just listing names. This isn't like, today we list names for documentation. He's not... He's not just documenting a a census or a a history record. He's, the author's telling, Matthew's telling a story through these names about the family of God and the family of God that leads to Jesus. And Jesus, who very, very much sees himself as someone who comes from this family, knows that it is his job to be the blessing to all of the earth that God first gave to Abram. And so because it's Jesus' story, it matters to us. But why else does it matter to us? It also matters because it's our story. It's the people's story who choose to follow Jesus. See, the apostle Paul, who was a, who was a convert, in fact, Paul had a big story of transformation. His life was heading one way and literally got flipped and turned upside down. And the way he understood his family story drastically changed when he met Jesus. And the Apostle Paul, he writes to this letter to the Ephesians, which today they believe is a letter that got passed around to all these churches in the community. And he opens up the letter with this blessing, right? This way to come in and say, this, this is who we are. Don't forget this. Before we talk about any of the stuff we're going to talk about, here is the blessing that you and I have. And let's read this together. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children. Through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasures of his will. To the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. 
With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will according to good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him on heaven and on earth. Can you leave that slide up just for a sec? Thank you, Ben. This last phrase, to gather up all things in heaven and earth. See, sometimes we make this mistake in the Christian world of saying it's us and it's them. Or when we think of the family of God, we think the promise is for us and not for them. But the promise to Abram was always to be a blessing to everyone, to bring everyone back to garden life. And the reason that Jesus has provided a way for us to be adopted as his children into his family is so that we can fulfill his blessing and bring all things to him. It all belongs to him. This is why this matters, because it's Jesus' family story. And if you and I choose so, if we choose to follow God, if we give our life to Jesus, if we make him king of our life, it is our family story as well. Um, there's a practice that started in the military in medieval times. And uh, it, it's, it was called uh, heralding. Have you guys heard, heard this word, heralding? Um, and they're not sure exactly what the origin is, but, you know, they would, they would have flags or they would wear things on their coat uh, that, that basically described who that person was or where they were from. And then over time, these started to go just from military to cities and groups, and then homes, and then eventually became this practice called the family crest. Have you guys heard that, the family crest? Any of you guys have a family crest? Like, I know some people still do that. That's awesome if you have one. Um, See, my family story is there's a lot of adoption in my family, so there's a lot of mysteries, and sometimes that impacts me, but I always thought it was cool, the friends I had, that their family had a long lineage. They could track where they came from. They knew how their family came to America, And, and sometimes I remember doing one of those projects, I saw a family crest at one of my friend's house. And I thought, whoa, that's so cool that they, they just preserved it for that so long. And, and family crests, they're special because, you know, you would hang them on flags or clothes or put them on something in your house. And, and they really said, this is who we are. Like the images together on the family crest would say, this, this is what matters to us. This is what our values are. This is who we are. This is what's important. Um, and so I, I thought today, just in light of reading the story of the, the origin of God's family and, and that it's Jesus' family, that's our family, uh, what would our family crest look like? You know, and maybe this would be a good exercise. You can go make your own, find symbols that are important to you. But based on today, I just came up with a crest that to me is like the family of God. This is our crest. And here it is right here. All right. In the first corner, there's a, a, a chain link. Because I believe in God's family, we believe that we're all connected. All of humanity, we are connected. We are from his. And so when we see people, even if they haven't chose to be a part of the family of God, We know that they still belong to him. We know that they're still our brother and sister, that that God has made them. They were made in the image of God. And we should show them love. And we should be a blessing to them. We're all linked together. Um, And I'll I'll go horizontal over to the butterfly. Uh, As the family of God, we are a family that has been transformed. We started out life as something and became something different because we joined the family of God. In fact, some of us in this room, because our, our, our original family was, was not something that was life-giving, we actually found family in the family of God. And we were transformed. We're different than when we, than when we first came. In the, in the bottom quarter with the hands and the heart, we are God's hands and feet to show his love to his creation. So part of our family story is being that blessing, right? That I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you so that you can be a blessing to all of the earth. Part of our purpose is to be that blessing. And then as we get ready to move into a time of communion, I thought, you know, our last symbols are the cup and the bread. 
I want to, I want to uh, share with you something right before we move into our communion time. Um, you know, this is a, it's fun to share Harry Potter because it's a story from kind of my childhood. And uh, there's a lot of kind of cool moments in this book where Harry's identity is being found in his parents, right? His parents who have died fighting somebody very evil. And uh, the people in the story, like Harry never knew his parents. So he just learns things from other people about his parents slowly at a time. And people always tell him things like, you look like your dad, but you have your mother's eyes, right? <laughs> And, and, and slowly he just gets these little, these little things about who they are. Um, but early on, Harry, Harry learns something about his mother, and it, it impacts who he is and what he does. And so I just want to read this quote from the book. Um, Harry's just defeated somebody early, early on in the series, and this is what the, the headmaster tells him. He says, your mother died to save you. If there is one thing Voldemort cannot understand, it is love. He didn't realize that love as powerful as your mother's for you leaves its own mark. Not a scar, not a visible sign to have been loved so deeply, even though the person who loved us is gone, will give us some protection forever. It is in your very own skin. Quirrell full of hatred, greed, and ambition, sharing his soul with Voldemort could not touch you for this reason. It was agony to touch a person marked by something so good. See, there's a story of love and sacrifice in Harry's mom. Part of the reason he lived is because of her love for him, that she put herself in front of someone trying to kill him. A story of sacrifice and love. Guys, the story of Jesus is still alive today. The story of love and sacrifice is, is one of the main parts of a book with over 600 million copies sold. Because the story of love and sacrifice of Jesus' body broken and his blood poured out, it's so ingrained in, in the last 2,000 years that it just keeps showing up over and over and over and over again. And so that last spot in the crest is our story of love and sacrifice. That our Lord and Savior, his body was broken and his blood was poured out. So that we could be adopted in. And so that we could be a part of the family of God. And we could be a blessing to all of the earth. And so in a moment, you're going to have time to um, get communion at the tables. Um, and it, I would encourage you today, if you meet with a group of people or if you have a neighbor, just tell somebody part of the story. Maybe, maybe tell somebody how you became a part of the family of God. And as we take communion, remember that Jesus has brought us in to be a part of his family. You're also welcome to take time to pray together. Maybe somebody in your row needs to be prayed for. Maybe there's someone on your heart or your mind today you know is struggling with something or needs encouragement. I would encourage you to follow that leading. Find that person. Pray with them. And then at the end, we'll, we'll worship together. We'll sing about who God is. You can go whenever you're ready.
if you haven't already, continue to um, pray together, take communion, and respond. And when you're ready, would you stand and let's just um, praise God together. There's a quote, and it's, when you know who you are, you'll know what to do. You are free. You are chosen. You're a child of God. That's what we just sung. In your stories, how you live them out and how you pass them on, it matters. And so I want to encourage you, what stories are you going to pass on? What story are you living out today? Because that story is the story that passes on from generation to generation, 
And so we want to hear about those stories. And so make sure that you grab this card in the back of the seats, pick it up, and share your story. We want to know what God's doing in your life, what he's doing around you, and what he's doing in you, whether that be now or in the, even in the past. It matters, you guys. In your story and how you pass it on, it matters. And so please take this card, fill it out. Um, after service, we do a thing called Mountain View and Five, and so Pastor Craig will be meeting you right over here. Um, bring your Connect card, whether it be that you want to serve, uh, you just need a place of connection, you want to be involved in a grow group, please fill it out, bring it over to Pastor Tom. He'd love an opportunity to connect with you. On that note, let's go out singing today. Just one touch.